So we're talking about the vocabulary in Unit 2. Um, uh, the, the first word, angelos, angelu, is a word for messenger. Remember, that's a word with a double gamma in it, so you pronounce it like the ng in, in pink. <laughs> Ang. It's ping, pink. You do a g. But anyway, no, it's, it's more like the ng in what, what, what's a better analogy. Finger. That's it. Yep. Okay. Angelos. Finger. Okay. Um, the next word is a pa, a preposition. Notice the book says, this is on page 53, by the way, in the textbook. That's what you want to be looking at. Um, and the, the next word is a preposition, a pa, which the book says plus gen after it, which means that it only takes objects in the genitive case. Um, and it means from or away from. Uh, we already had ek, okay? Um, and the book has a beautiful little chart on page 54 explaining the difference between apa and ek, okay? I'm not gonna, uh, as soon as you see it, you'll understand what it means. Um, we talked about ahara already, the particle that introduces a question. Um, the next two words, gar, and de, these are one-syllable words, okay, and it, um, it says about them in parentheses that they are post-positive conjunctions. So a conjunction is a word that ties one sentence or one complete grammatical unit to another, and post-positive means that they can't come first in a sentence. They can't, they have to be postponed, okay? Mm -hmm. What that actually means is that they come second in a sentence, okay? So um, Greek is a language that's particularly rich in words like gar and de. And in fact, the study of these words is in its infancy, believe it or not. This is a language that's been around for more than 2,800 years, and we're still learning things about it. Um, so the book has definitions of these little words like gar and de that are very uh, simplifying, mm -hmm. and they're much more complex. So it tells you that gar means for in the explanatory sense, okay? Um, that's a usage that I think is obsolete in real English. We don't use for to explain things. In other words, it's, uh, you ever say a sentence like, uh, I went to I went to the restaurant for I was hungry. That, that's, <laughs> nobody says that. <laughs> so what it means is cuz, C-U-Z, okay? And, and I say that it's because it's something more informal than because, okay? Um, and it gives a reason, but it also explains, okay? That's why it says it's explanatory. There are, there are complexities to this word that are um, not being explained. The next word, de, um, the post-positive conjunction again, it says it means, but that's definitely wrong, okay? It means and or but, okay? Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's not a conjunction that always uh, is in opposition to what's come before. And um, it's the simplest kind of conjunction in Greek. And here's something weird about Greek compared to English or probably any other language that you all know. Every sentence has to be connected to the previous sentence mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a given context with a little word like de. So you have to say whether the sentence that you're about to speak, what is its logical or emotional, and sometimes both, um, or in, you know, much more complex relationship to the previous one, okay? So we start out English sentences with but and 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 whereas and all those. These are words like that, okay? But Greek has a bunch of them, and it also combines them, and it's highly sensitive about these things. So the best example, uh, the best way I, I can think of explaining them is uh, the, those little things that uh, we used to call smileys and some people call emoticons in email messages. Which, which give you the flavor of, the, of, the, of a sentence or a phrase, okay? Usually, the cool thing about them that's different is that they come after mm -hmm. something. So you say, wait a minute, what does that mean? And then the emoticon, is this person being ironic or cute or silly? Or, <laughs> uh, okay, all those things can be expressed in Greek little words that come at the beginning of the sentence, okay? 
So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a fantastic thing about this language and an important thing to try and learn properly if you can, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and teach you fun things about that. Okay, the next word is hex, uh, the word for six, the number six in Greek, gives us the English word hex, which is a, you know, a hex that you put on someone, okay, <laughs> because of the, the associations of the number six with witchcraft and the devil and all those kinds of things. Um, the, that's an indeclinable numeral. In other words, it's an adjective hex, um, but it doesn't have any gender, number, and case, mm -hmm. right? There aren't many words in Greek like that. In fact, um, the, the, in the, when, it, when we learn the numbers, which we're not going to learn for a long time, unfortunately, um, the, um, only the first three numbers really are declinable, have, have the words, for numbers for the names for the numbers one, two, and three right. can be declined. And four, actually, it's the first four. Um, Tetaras also have it. But after that, the numbers are all just one form, no matter what the, what the thing that you're counting is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and it's got, that's got to be something really old. All right. Uh, the next word is eo, an adverb. Okay? An adverb is like, the best way to understand an adverb, if you don't know what one is, is um, as an adjective is to a noun, so an adverb is to a verb. That is, um, if, if an adjective for a noun is like the big house, big is an adjective. For a verb, you can say, I went slowly. Okay, so slowly explains or uh, limits or qualifies something about the verbal notion of uh, expressed by went. Okay, um, so eo is a is a very simple adverb. I did something well. I I I ate well. I jumped well, all those kinds of things in English, okay? Not the wishing well. <laughs> all right, um, next word is a neuter noun of the second declension of the type doron. It's zoion with an iota subscript, okay? And it means living thing. Um, it, the book translates it animal, that's okay. It's, it's a thing that's alive, um, and, um, and it gives us English words like zoo and zoology. Stuff like that. Um, next word, we have more little words. E, just the letter eta with a smooth breathing and an accent. Notice those are really important things. There are, there are actually two or three words in Greek that consist of the letter eta and they have different accents. And then if you have a rough breathing, it's something else altogether. So you have to pay attention to the diacritics with A. And it means or. Um, but all, when there's only one by itself, when there are two in connection with each other, uh, in other words, if you say A, X, A, Y, okay, then it means either or, okay? Um, um, that's a, uh, it's a special kind of either, but anyway, until we get the other kind of either, we'll, we'll not talk about it. All right, we learn a new verb. Uh, we, have, we have actually two new verbs in this lesson. Um, keleo, which means to order, okay, give somebody an order, and the book gives you the principal parts of the verb whenever it gives them. So, so uh, principal parts are all the stems that you need to form uh, a Greek verb. Unfortunately, you've only had just the beginning, right? The present, the future, the aorist, and the imperfect. So, you know, the only forms of the principal parts that are relevant to you so far are the first one, keleo, which is the present, the second one, keleoso, which is the future, and the third one, ekeleoso, which is the aorist. The, the next ones, just if you're curious, are the perfect, the perfect middle, we don't even have the, haven't even had the middle, and then the last one is the aorist passive. There is a separate passive for some forms of Greek. You put that epsilon over the wrong... Oh. Well, we're looking at me instead of... Well, was. <laughs> okay, so um, the... the um, um, I, I think until we understand what these things are, uh, there's not a whole lot of point in learning them, but if you want to learn them, it doesn't hurt. Um, we need to learn principal parts of Greek verbs, and the principal parts of kalewo are regular. That is, they're just like... If you look down the page to paideo, which is our, or or look down even less far to luo, 
they're they're almost identical. The one thing that's funny about Kaleo is that you have this S that gets stuck in in the next to the last and the last principal parts. In other words, what should be Kekeleo my becomes Kekeleos my, and Kekeleo thing becomes a Kekeleos thing. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the, those things have to do with peculiar circumstances of applying to certain words and. And uh, it's kind of a wildly annoying thing, but you get the hang of those things. Um, so it does. It wouldn't hurt to learn first Paideo and then learn how Kaleo is different. For example, that's an efficient way. Mm -hmm. um, it only has two forms that are different from the re regular form of the principal parts. Anyway, it means order or command. And when you say order or command, um, you you it's one of those words that governs a complementary infinitive, okay? So so you can say, I teach you to do something, but you can you much more regularly you say, I teach Greek, without saying to. With order, you almost always have an infinitive. I order you to do something. Mm -hmm. And it's inherent to the meaning. And that too is what ex is expressed with an infinitive, either the present, so-called present infinitive, which is really the infinitive of the imperfective aspect, or the aorist infinitive which is the infinitive of the aorist aspect. All right, um, next are, are, are two of the most common little post-positive conjunctions in Greek. Um, these are words like gar and de, and they're mene and de. Mm -hmm. Okay, you already had de, okay, but it, it occurs when in, in combination with men, okay, and the book over-translate them. Notice these are post-positive too, that is they can't come first in a sentence. The book over-translate them as the, on the one hand, on the other, okay? Um, so so uh, in the beginning of Raj's history, he talks about how there were things done by the Greeks, men, and the barbaroi, that is the non-Greeks, de, okay? Um, Greeks tend to think, uh, and, uh, it, and it's one of the most important things about the way they think, and the way most many people think, okay, it's not particularly Greek, but in comparative terms, okay. So what's what's in order to understand themselves, they look at the way other people do things differently. Um, in order to understand what one color is, you look at it against another color, stuff like that. So so men and de is a ubiquitous feature in Greek, and and on the one hand, and on the other hand, overkill is overkill, okay. Sometimes you don't want to even translate it at all because the contrast or the comparison, and it's both of those things. It's not always that the two things are contrasted, uh, or be, it's often that they're being compared or they're put in parallel to one another. Um, so it's it's a it's a rather more flexible notion than than on the one hand and on the other. Okay, um, you're not going to even want to translate these things at all in English. Okay, but they're they're helpful in Greek and understanding. If you get the men coming, you you actually expect a de, although there are cases of men without a de. Uh, that's an important thing. In other words, when that when the men is missing, it changes the meaning of the, when the de is missing. Ra missing rather, mm -hmm. it changes the meaning of the men, right? And and so uh, um, there are, there are fun things like that about the way Greek uses these little words. All right, the next one syllable word is another word. This one can come and often most of the time does come at the beginning of a sentence. Nun, that's nu upsilon, and followed by another nu with a circumflex accent, and it tells you that it means now, okay? That's kind of not a whole lot, because now means a bunch of things in English. It means now as in the t in time, okay, the present, okay? Um, but it also means now, there's another sense of now when you say, now, let's talk about this. That doesn't have anything to do with time, right? It's about changing gears and going on to discuss something else, right? That's a Greek particle kind of word, okay, What that kind of now. So nun means both of those, these things, and it does come first in a sentence, and it's usually followed by other particles like gar and de to explain what, and to help you understand what it's, what it's saying, okay? Um, all right, next word is xenos, um, a word that begins with a xi, and in English, when English words begin with an x, um, we pronounce it as like a Z, like in xylophone, okay, mm -hmm. but in Greek it's really KS. So what's this notion of xenos? It tells you that it means these things, guest friend, host, stranger, 
and foreigner. Okay, what the heck is an unholy combination? Somebody who's a friend and a stranger and a host and a foreigner. Well, it's one concept in Greek, and it means um, somebody to whom or with whom you have a, a reciprocal relationship. Okay, um, and and uh, it only means a stranger um, until because uh, until you've really cemented the reciprocal relationship. In other words, a xenos is only a stranger until they've become your host or your guest. The way it works is in, in this culture, if you come to somebody's house, okay, um, and, uh, uh, and you knock on the door, okay, I don't know about knocking on the door, you say, hey, you yell out to them, okay, they didn't have door knockers. Forget about knocking on the door. <laughs> if you yell out to them, okay, um, they'll open the door and invite you in, okay? Sit you down on a nice chair. Wash your feet. Give you something to eat. Okay, once they've done all those things, then they can say, so, who are you? And have you come to rob me and steal all my things and kill me? Or are you a nice person? Okay? So that's the way it works, all right? Literally. And um, because there's an assumption that, uh, that people are bound to each other. Um, and and, uh, and the system is is set up so that once you accept this kind of hospitality for some from someone which looks freely given and very generous and everything like that mm -hmm. what that does is obligate them to you right um, and that's part of the point that's the, it's ex, it's the explicit thing is is generous and kind the implicit thing is you, you as soon as you accept this you owe me stuff Okay, and what you owe me is to become my host. Right. Okay, if I'm your host and you're my guest, automatically this, the roles are reversed when I come to your house. Okay, so that's why it can mean these paradoxical or, or peculiar things a stranger, a guest, and a host. Okay, um, these relationships are really important in, in this culture, and, um, and, the, and they survive into modern Greece too. Okay, they. There, there is a very strong rules about hospitality in in modern Greece, and although modern culture is leveling that out, modern American culture in particular is mm -hmm. leveling that out, um, it's still there. And you know, you go into a Greek village, and they'll, the first thing they'll do is make you sit down and eat with them. Okay, this happens. Okay, or I've been with Greeks, and they're out in the countryside. There's nobody around. They come to a house. They go in the house and take some food. Why you do that? Well, it's because the assumption is that you'll give them back stuff. Okay, so so it's a, it is a kind of an amazing and wonderful way of looking at human relationships. So um, anyway, lots of lots of stuff about xenos, maybe too much, but it's a, it's an important cultural thing. All right, the next word is the negative adverb not. Okay, so this is a a, um, a word that you can't do without in any language. Greek is particularly interested in negatives. Okay, it's a language that loves saying positive things in a negative way, like saying this is not bad. That that's a typical Greek thing. Okay, that's a typical Greek way of doing things. So, what are the three forms? There's u, there's uk with a kappa, and uk with a ki. Okay, and here's the way they work. And notice they have no accent. Okay, there is one particular case when you can have an accent, but it's a it's a word like ek. And um, and n the prepositions ek and n that also have no accent. It goes with a word that comes after it. So if you want to say not happy, you do it in the same word order as in English. You put the u or the uk or the uk first, and then the word for happy. Um, anyway, u goes before consonants. Uk before uh, vowels that don't have a uh, a rough breathing, and uk goes before vowels that do have a rough breathing. The you remember the relationship between uk with the, the kappa and uk the key is that the key has the the h the aspiration. Effectively, what's happening is that you're writing the the rough breathing when you write the key. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not that you are going to pronounce two aspirations. It's just a redundant writing system that predates the existence of the breathing marks. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we get the verb paideo that means teach or educate. Um, it, it's a verb that, like the English verb um, teach, can take two direct objects, like as in, I teach you Greek. Okay? Um, in English, we think of that you as being an indirect object, which is a reasonable thing, because you can also say, I teach you. Okay? 
Um, but then uh, in Greek, it's treated as a direct object. So it, it takes two of them. Next word is para, okay, the word for, um, uh, it, well, it has three different meanings, another preposition. And this one has three different meanings with three different ca uh, cases. So, and these are not totally random, okay? Notice that the book says that with a genitive, it means from the side of, with a dative at the side of, and with the accusative to the side of. These are aspects of the different cases, and the underlying idea of the preposition is the side of, okay? So we have words like that are derived from para in English, like parallel, which means next to or beside one, something that's alongside one another. Another thing, okay. Um, but here, when it, when it's when it's, you know, the genitive is the case of separation. The dative is the case of locating something at a point in space, as in at the side of. And the accusative is, we've seen um, this before. We it's the case of of uh, the goal of motion, okay. Um, or have we seen this before? I'm not sure we have. It's the mm. direct object, but in 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 uh, in really older Greek than classical Greek. If you want to say, I went to somebody's house, you can just put the word for house as a direct object of the verb. You don't even need a word for to, okay? So the prepositions are, are relatively new development, actually, in Greek, and, um, and they, 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 uh, they're slowly taking over. But, there are, um, but the accusative works for the direct object and the thing that you're heading towards. So prepositions that mean to, uh, as in, uh, in, or into, like ace, mm -hmm. have objects that go in the accusative case. All right, we've got pempo, a verb that we've already had. We know that it means send, as in send off, okay, and or escort, okay, and um, not as in send a letter. And it gives you its principal parts, pempo, pempso, epempso, are the ones that we're really interested in. The other principal parts are very weird by comparison to paideo and luo and kaleo. Okay, have a look at them at your own time. Um, we'll come back to the thing talking about them. We then learn the number five, pente, which like hex, the number six, doesn't have any case gender or number endings. We got the noun polemos, whose genitive is polemu, and it's masculine, ha. In other words, it's a logos type noun, and it means war, okay? Not battle, but war, okay? Um, and then get rounding off the thing, you've got pra, the preposition, which only takes one case, the genitive, and means before or in front of. The noun Stephanos, Stefanu, another logos type noun, which gives us the name Stephen, um, comes from the, word, the, the, the verb that means to put a wreath on something, and it is a wreath, a, a crown. Wreaths are important things in daily life in ancient Greece. For example, if you're a person doing a sacrifice, sacrificial ritual, you put on a wreath. Um, what the wreath is made out of depends on the god involved and stuff like that. So you have wreaths made out of bay leaf, bay, bays, or the laurel uh, leaf branches. You can have leaves made out of parsley. You have leaves with different uh, uh, different uh, leaves made out of ivy, which are associated with the god Dionysus and stuff like that. You also have the the the, um, the the prizes in the Olympic Games, okay, were and in all these sporting games were wreaths, okay. Didn't get money, you got a wreath. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a big deal in this this culture. Um, the next word, um, the next to last word in the list is the adjective philos, or not the adjective, the noun philos, um, whose genitive is philu and whose gender is masculine. Um, we just lost the lights, and police is going to step up over there and make them come on again. Um, so, philos philo means a friend. Usually, if you just there, oh, if you just pull the there, okay. <laughs> so annoying. All right, philos it is the noun for friend, okay, and um, and in the, it's different from the English concept of friend in that. Friends and philoi includes your relatives, so it really means a person who's near and dear to you in a more general sense, a larger term than our term friend. They also give you a, what a noun derived from it, philia, okay, that suffix ia is, a, is an abstract noun suffix in Greek. So philos means friends, philia means friendship, okay, don't confuse the two. Last word, krusos, okay, 
another noun of the type philos and logos and stephanos, okay, second declension masculine noun, which means gold, the metal. All right, that's it.